One of the challenges is that when we study new treatments, they may or may not work, unfortunately. And so critical to all of this is making sure that everyone who's involved and, you know, most importantly, the patient um, understands that that is indeed the case. And so long as we're all understanding that these treatments, you know, some of them are now FDA approved, as I mentioned, but a lot of the treatments that we're developing are actually not FDA approved, that, um, you know, people understand that that is the case and that this treatment shouldn't be considered something that the patient might benefit from. Now, that said, all of these treatments that are now FDA approved, the only way that we got them to be FDA approved was we brought patients onto these trials. They were informed of the potential risks. And it's only through these studies that we're able to do that. Cure Talks. This is Priya Menon, your host. Today on Cure Talks, we are discussing cellular therapy. We have with us cancer immunotherapist Dr. Lawrence Fong from the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Fong has over two decades of experience working with preclinical and clinical studies of FDA approved immunotherapies. Joining Dr. Fong on the panel today are patient advocates Heidi Floyd and Cynthia Shmilovsky. Welcome to Cure Talks, everyone. Using cell therapy to halt and reverse disease, restore damaged organs, and ultimately cure many life-threatening conditions is now a realistic goal for our scientists. Dr. Fong, can you briefly, in layman's language, explain what cell therapy is? Well, cell therapy is a treatment approach where we actually give cells either from the same patient or from another individual um, to really try to address a certain type of disease. You know, we've actually been using cell therapies for over 50, 60 years in the form of bone marrow transplantation. And so in that example, um, what we do is we'll either take bone marrow from the same patient or from somebody else and give it to that patient to restore their ability to actually make blood cells typically following chemotherapy and radiation therapy that's, that's given for their treatment. Um, but one of the things that we found with the bone marrow transplants was that in addition to um, allowing the patient to make their own blood cells, they also, these transplants also transferred immune cells. And those immune cells uh, within the, the graft, what's given to the patient, actually helps to kill the cancer cells within the patients. And so building upon that, one of the areas of excitement in, in cancer therapies now is really to hone in on those immune cells that are capable of, of killing the cancer cells. And that's where uh, many groups, including our own, are working on ways to engineer a patient's own immune cells, or again, immune cells from another, another host and give them back to an individual with cancer. And we now have FDA approved treatments for B cell malignancies, so leukemias and lymphomas, mm -hmm. as well as uh, for multiple myeloma. And there's a lot of activity trying to broaden that out to other cancers at the present time. And these are in the form of these CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptor T cells. That's a way of engineering those immune cells to actually recognize the cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Fong, other than cancer, are we using cell therapy in other diseases as well? You know, absolutely. You know, I think um, this is an area where um, there's a lot of interest in actually using cells, again, from, from donors um, to help treat disease. Um, and uh, there are examples where, for instance, with islet cell transplants, we're taking those pancreatic islet cells to help people with diabetes um, and there also is interest in terms of on the regenerative medicine 
um, efforts to think about ways that we can give cell therapies that might actually help um, a patient heal or restore areas that might have been impacted by disease. But this is an emerging area that is, you know, continuing to to evolve and, and develop. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, I'm going to ask you a question, which I keep getting, you know, I see it being discussed in forums and uh, people are very confused about it. Like are, uh, when you say stem cell therapy, right? Uh, what does that entail? Is that part of cell therapy? Uh, like how are stem cells, if they are, then how are stem cells used in cell therapy? Yeah, you know, it's with when we think about stem cell therapy, we often will think about um, situations where we give a cell that can give rise to other cells and repopulate and continue to maintain a person, hopefully for the rest of their lives. And the, the best example of that are these bone marrow transplants or what we also call peripheral stem cell therapies where we can actually harvest circulating stem cells from a patient or from a donor um, and then give those back to a patient. And those stem cells are actually what's able to repopulate, um, in this case, a, a patient's immune system. Um, we're looking at stem cell therapies in other contexts, not just focusing on bone marrow replenishing blood production, but looking at other tissues, because as we've learned in the laboratory, that there are stem cells for many different types of tissues. And this is an active area of research in terms of trying to see what stem cells we could think about giving to a patient that might restore a tissue that might um, be uh, uh, impacted by disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Fong, what is the Living Therapeutics Initiative that uh, UCSF is having? And what are some of the disease areas that are being explored under this? Yeah, so the at, at UCSF, um, uh, over the last you know two to three years, we've um, initiated um, a program that's called the Living Therapeutics Initiative that's focused on developing and manufacturing cell therapies. And the thinking here is that rather than giving a treatment that is inert and you know goes into a patient and um, you know uh, 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 basically is cleared out of the system, we're giving cells that are living and persisting within the patient that will help um, treat a disease. And so the example that I gave with regards to CAR T cells is one example, but there are actually other immune-based treatments to target cancer that are also being studied, including using T-cell receptors and other uh, targeting um, domains that we can use to, to, to potentially treat cancer. But it's really expanded beyond cancer. You could think about um, situations where we're uh, um, engineering immune cells rather than trying to kill cancer cells, actually trying to quiet autoimmune disease or other types of diseases where the immune system is actually overactive. You could also think about situations where uh, individuals might have uh, genetic errors that prevent them from producing certain molecules or proteins. Um, and by actually engineering the cells, you could actually have those cells now make the protein in an individual. And, you know, probably the best examples of those are the efforts, you know, focused on hemophilia and thalassemia. Um, and then, you know, there also is interest in terms of using these cells to help with other diseases, including heart disease. Uh, and so I think it's, it's really broadened um, how we can think about medicine. Um, and, you know, one of the hopes is with these living therapies, you give the treatment and you might give it once or twice, but then once the cells are on board, um, the patient might be potentially cured or might enter into a, a long remission and not require continued treatment as they might with many of these different diseases.
Uh, uh, Dr. Fong, uh, I believe toxicity is, uh, is one of the challenges that uh, face cell therapies. Could you talk us through some of the tools that can be used uh, to manage and improve these? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as you might imagine, when we give something living into a person, that might elicit a response either from those cells that we've put into the person or from the person's body actually adapting to those, those immune cells. And um, this has certainly been the case with CAR T cells where we're giving patients these engineered T cells that are hardwired to recognize proteins on their cancer cells. And when they see that, they become very activated, which is what we'd want them to do. And they expand within a person. Um, oftentimes, you know, uh, 10,000, 100,000 fold. Um, and whenever you have that type of an activation, the immune system basically sends out messages to the body um, it's not as it's very similar to um, when a person might have an overwhelming infection, like even you know COVID infection, where we have a lot of these immune and inflammatory mediators, proteins that send out danger signals throughout the body, and so as a result, uh, people who get these treatments can develop these. Uh, potentially life-threatening side effects that include high fevers, dropping of the blood pressure, difficulty breathing. And as these treatments have been developed, we actually have been understanding how these are actually triggered and what some of those proteins that mediate the signals are. And in doing so, we can actually use treatments that actually target those proteins. And so one of the examples is IL-6. We know with CAR T-cell treatments, we can develop what's called cytokine release syndrome or, or CRS. And one of the cytokines that really goes up is IL-6. And so there's actually antibodies that we can give to block those um, cytokines and IL-6 in particular. And in doing so, that basically is an effective way to actually treat this toxicity. As we get more experience with more treatments, you know, we're hoping that our understanding of what triggers these side effects will continue and build upon the success with these anti-IL-6 antibodies and have other drugs that we can use to help prevent this, the side effects that come on. Um, but that said, um, what, we're, what we do now is when someone gets these treatments, we typically bring them into the hospital so that we can observe them for a period of time. And if they develop any of these um, side effects, we can give them treatments to quiet down the immune response. One of the hopes is with technologies, we could try to shift some of that treatment from the hospital out of the hospital. And you know, this is where there's a lot of research that's going on, including using wearables so that um, we might be able to detect you know, some of these side effects mm -hmm. even while a person is at home and be able to bring them back. Um, this is all actually being developed, so it's not standard now, but you could envision a year or two years from now that this might become a, a much more common approach uh, to really um, make this an easier treatment for everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fong. Uh, I'd like to bring in the panel for their questions now. Uh, Heidi, uh, you can start with yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fong, for what you're doing. It's, it's very exciting. And I personally have many friends who have been helped by this type of research and very excited about the future. Um, decades ago, uh, gosh, half a century, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the cells of Henrietta Lacks really sparked a kind of a revolution in cancer research, um, her cells in particular, among other types of research, not just cancer, of course. And that was kind of a continuation of years of distrust be between underserved populations and the research community, as, as we all know. Um, before we kind of dive into more details, can you please just briefly explain, explain to us, to everyone, how the industry has changed to become a lot more inclusive and transparent um, for, for the rest of our community. 
Oh, absolutely. I think one of the the travesties in the case with Henrietta Lacks was really um, not uh, consent or um, information that was actually provided um, Ms. Lacks. And um, our approach to clinical research, as well as delivering a lot, all these different treatments now require uh, informed consent where people actually understand what it is we're doing, um, what the potential risks are. And oftentimes with some of these treatments, we may not know what those risks are, but we, we, we convey that in and, of its, in and of itself to an individual. And then to understand whether or not the cells or the genes that might be identified within an individual could be used in the future. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, that mm -hmm. one of these keys is, you know, now the uniform and universal use of informed consent, um, where everybody yes. yeah. has a, a right to know uh, exactly what is, is going to happen, but also what the risks are. And they also have the opportunity not to participate or not yeah. to um, receive a treatment. And so that um, has been a, a big change um, from you know, what, what happened um, at that time. Very good, thank you very much. That's something that's frequently discussed in our community. So I wanted to make sure that I kind of addressed that right from the get-go. Um, yeah. There are scores of us, um, not just Cynthia and myself, there are scores of patient advocates out there globally um, who like, Everyone else, we're just fascinated by the incandescent promises of everything that you just discussed, the cell therapies, the, the wearables, everything going forward, uh, particularly the work that's being done by the LTI. Is there any mechanism for patients to be directly involved with this initiative um, to help in any capacity, not just like clinical trials, but also clinical trials? Are there advocacy panels, um, any way that we could work with this, you know, other learning institutions to help expedite any f future cures? Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, uh, you know, for these new treatments, um, it, it really takes a village in order to, to get these types of treatments off, off the ground. And this is something that UCSF is not actually able to do on its own. It really requires a partnership with patients, with advocates, mm -hmm. with the community, you know, in order to, to really get this type of an approach off the ground. Um, as you might imagine, you know, these treatments are very complicated and take a lot of resource actually to develop and not just develop in the laboratory, but to actually translate them into the clinic where we can actually give something actually to a person. And th this is a really time consuming and costly endeavor. Yeah, yeah. And this is where, you know, resources are actually needed to support this. And in many ways, with our existing funding mechanisms, like from the National Institutes of Health and, and other yeah. avenues, a lot of the times this type of research is actually not supported. And so this is where advocacy to help support this type of work and also the need to raise funds to actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, develop these treatments is, is, is critically important. And you know, at, at UCSF, we've been fortunate to be able to start this initiative uh, really driven by the community interest and philanthropy and resources that were raised. If, it, if we didn't have that, there actually would be no initiative. We we think about it, you know, on a on a, a, a chalkboard, but um, it wouldn't exist. And so that's a clear example where, if it wasn't for community support, um, this 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 whole initiative would not have started. Lovely, thank you. Wow, that's great, um, Dr. Fong. Can you please explain for those of us listening who are not who may not be familiar with all the complex terms and ideas used in in this detailed research? Explain how this research, if it does not pose any, poses zero ethical issues compared to previous research that may that we may have been reading about that might have caused concern. If you could just kind of clarify that for us, I'd be grateful. Yeah, well, I think I think you know, part of um, you know what we're doing with this treatment is really 
to improve how we target cancer in our case. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the challenges is that when we study new treatments, they may or may not work, unfortunately. And so critical to all of this is making sure that everyone who's involved and, you know, most importantly, the patient um, understands that that is indeed the case. And so long as we're all understanding that these treatments, you know, some of them are now FDA approved, as I mentioned, but a lot of the treatments that we're developing are actually not FDA approved, that, um, you know, people understand that that is the case and that this treatment shouldn't be considered something that the patient might benefit from. Now, that said, all of these treatments that are now FDA approved, the only way that we got them to be FDA approved was we brought patients onto these trials. They were informed of the potential risks. And it's only through these studies that we're able to do that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's critically important um, that patients understand the risk. But again, the goal of all of this is actually to have better treatments in our case for cancer. Lovely. Thank you so much for your time and your answer to the questions. Okay. Thank you, Heidi. Cindy, you can go with yours. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Fong. This is this is such an exciting topic, and I'm such a science nerd that this fascinates me so much. And um, and being a myeloma patient, many of my friends have benefited from the CAR T cell therapy. I mean. Patients who are completely out of options just gave them a whole new lease on life. So talking about these cellular therapies, I, I, I know many of them have to be manufactured. That means, I guess, you know, the cells are taken out of your bodies or a donor's bodies and cells taken to maybe a place like your lab to somehow be manufactured to then go after your cancer. The FDA approves the final treatment, but is there any regulation of that manufacturing process to make sure it's safe, to make sure that my cells get back to me, to make sure my cells aren't mixed with somebody else's cells? I mean, it just seems kind of scary as a patient that I give you some cells and six weeks later I get them back, but I don't know where they go and if they're safely being manufactured or if they're even mine. Yeah, no, that's that's a critical uh, question, a critical issue. And, you, you know, to address that, um, ab absolutely, yes, there are many checks and balances in place in terms of making sure that a person gets the right cells. And so if these are what we call autologous products, in other words, cells from the same person, those basically have identifiers that basically track with the product, um, you know, all the way through, including when they're infused back into an individual. And oftentimes when the cells are produced, their pro the processing in and of itself actually gets separated so that these cells are processed either in this machine or in this room or somewhere where it's segregated from another cell product for another individual. And so that type of identification and tracking um, is actually um, critically important through the whole process. And one of the technical terms we use for that is chain of custody. There has to be a chain where we actually know wh where the cells were and that, that these are the right cells. I think, you know, to your other point, the FDA um, requires um, specific criteria, what we call release criteria, to determine whether or not we can administer cells to a patient. And um, these are um, uh, uh, um, processes where we need to make sure, you know, that the cells are not infected, that the cells actually are doing what we think they're, that, they're do, that they're doing, and that we've actually mitigated risk, you know, for the person who's actually receiving this, the cells. And so oftentimes there will be a very thick manual that basically defines all of the processes that are there, but mm -hmm. also what those release criteria are. 
where the cells need to meet, you know, meet that threshold before they can actually be administered to an individual. And so, you know, this is, this is an area that is fairly heavily regulated and it is an evolving field, as you might imagine, as our cell therapies develop and evolve and become more sophisticated, those types of criteria will also evolve. Um, but, you know, at the present time, um, you know, just to lay your concerns, there, there are, um, you know, quite a few checks and balances in place to avoid any of these problems that, that, that you're worried about. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, in the real world, there's always going to be um, a potential for mistakes, um, but the goal is to really um, minimize that. Thank you. I'm a little bit more relieved that there's some regulation going on there and yeah. not everyone can just manufacture their own T-cell product. So that makes me feel a little bit better. And yeah. I, I was reading on your site about that AI program that was able to identify like those antigens in the kidney cancer and then make a CAR T to just that that was exciting. But my concern is because I'm a myeloma patient, the myeloma CAR Ts have not lasted as long in the body, persisted as in the other types of cancers. And one of the things that they're talking about that might be is this thing called T cell exhaustion, that our T cells are used and too exhausted to do the job or to persist. Now, we don't know if that's for sure, but that's one of the things that I'm hearing about. And I'm imagining that's not gonna only be with myeloma patients, that other people's T cells may be beat up over time and maybe not be the great ones to make the product. So, should patients who are diagnosed with cancer like harvest their T cells ahead of time? Like we harvest our, being a myeloma patient, I harvest my stem cells right away so I can have that early, you know, the stem cell transplant. Should I be harvesting, harvesting T cells? Or is there a way to revitalize T cells to make them stronger? Or should we be looking at other immune cells that might not wear out as much, maybe like natural killer cells or other types of immune cells? Can So can you talk a little bit about that T-cell exhaustion? Yeah, well, when we think about T-cell exhaustion, what one of the ways to think about it is, you know, these T-cells in our body, you know, we, we rely on them to actually fight infection, like, you know, with COVID or the flu or other um, uh, you know, types of uh, uh, viruses. In our case, we're actually relying on them to target the cancer. And what happens is that these immune cells are great at um, addressing an infection, something that comes on, you clear the infection, it goes away, and then the immune system sort of quiets down after that. And um, you know, one of the ways that it can quiet down is through these T cells becoming exhausted. They they did their thing, they killed the infected cells, and now, um, you know, they basically stop their function. In the setting of cancer, the problem is that the 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 cancer cells may continue to persist despite this burst of the T cells basically targeting, um, you know, the cancer cells. And um, as a result, while they're killing the cancer cells, they may not be able to kill every last cancer cell. And as a result, they basically become rendered non-functional or what we call, you know, exhausted. Um, I, at, at this point in time, you know, we don't know if we were to harvest your T cells early in a course of multiple myeloma versus late how much that would affect um, you know, the product. We think that that would actually improve the CAR T cells that we get out of that. But those studies are actually now being done where we're now giving CAR T cells rather than waiting for treatment refractory multiple myeloma, we're giving it to folks earlier and earlier in, in the disease. And so I think with those studies, we'll learn whether or not getting the T cells and banking them will be, you know, advantageous. Um, but, um, you know, we, we don't know the answer to that. I think, you know, for your 
for your other question is, can we actually make the um, CAR T cells resistant to exhaustion? This is something that we and many groups and many companies actually are working on. If we can actually engineer these T cells, not just to recognize the cancer, but actually to resist exhaustion, we could potentially get, get around that. And so, um, you know, this is something that um, um, is really um, a big push throughout the field to develop. And as you mentioned, people are thinking about other cell types like NK cells or gamma delta T cells or other cells that might um, resist exhaustion. But this is something that unfortunately is, you know, inherent with a lot of cancers. With some cancers, we get that big expansion and it clears the cancer. And that happens with, you know, diseases like leukemias and, and some lymphomas. But with others like multiple myeloma, it's just a harder disease to clear. And as a result, we have to figure out ways to actually make these CAR T cells uh, perform even better. Okay. That, that kind of makes sense to me now. So keep on working on that. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I guess, you know, I, I'm a little bit interested in are these gene editing technologies like Talon and CRISPR, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, when you're giving someone else's cells to you, the allogenetic products, sometimes at risk of graft versus host disease exist, but it would be really nice to have an off the shelf product because right now we're waiting way too long for these products. People are being put on waiting lists and sometimes they just can't. So an off the shelf allo product would be fine. So how is this gene editing helping this graft versus host disease? Yeah, so what happens um, whenever we think about transplants or giving cells from another individual into a patient, what happens is that our bodies actually can recognize cells as being foreign and will reject them. Just like you know, they recognize how um, in, uh, cells could be infected by viruses. If something is not right, the immune system's primed to basically kill those cells. And so as a result, um, um, the cells that you give to a, a patient, if they're derived from somebody else, not only can mediate, you know, graft versus host, which means, you know, the cells basically targeting tissues in the person, the recipient of those cells, but there's also a potential for host versus graft. So a person's, the patient's immune system basically rejecting the cells that are being uh, given to that individual. And so for these off the shelf treatments, we have to actually engineer these cells so that they actually don't express some of these proteins that the immune system uses to recognize um, these differences between individuals. And so that's where CRISPR and Talon technologies come in, where you can edit these out um, to, um, in an effort to have uh, these cells escape immune recognition. Um, and, um, you know, this is something that we're still continuing to learn and understand which genes we actually need to edit and which we don't need to edit. Um, and, um, you know, the, the hope is if we understand that fully, that we can have full off the shelf treatments. Um, I think right now it's, it's, this is still very, um, uh, um, invest, it's very much investigational experimental therapies. Um, but your, to your point, having something off the shelf that we can give somebody is very different than an autologous product where we actually have to wait in some cases months, you know, for that treatment. And that might come on top of having waited months to get a slot to actually get the treatment. And so, um, you know, I think this is, this is one of the critical areas that that um, again, many groups, including our own, are working on um, because it would be a huge advance. Yeah, thank thank you so much. This is it's such an exciting field. I 
I, I, I just love it. I guess the tech science geek, but yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you, Cindy. Uh, one last question, Dr. Fong, before we can wrap up for today. Um, I know you work extensively on CAR T cells. So can you tell us what is the latest exciting thing that's happening with CAR T? Well, I think um, a lot of the excitement that's going on now is that um, we have a lot of developments that are going on in the laboratory where we're developing new circuits to reprogram these CAR T cells. And, um, you know, as we touched upon briefly, thinking about, you know, more and more targets that we could go after that uh, um, might broaden these treatments across, um, you know, many different cancers. I think, you know, the other component is now that we have these CAR T cells in the clinic, we can actually learn why they're working and why they're not working in an individual. And so this is where, as an example, with multiple myeloma, um, you know, some patients can have durable responses, but unfortunately, a lot of people, unfortunately, have their um, myeloma come back um, uh, uh, following these CAR T cells. You know, we are not batting a thousand, you know, at this point. Um, and, um, and so there's actually a lot of room for improvement. And I think um, by us seeing this clinically and then being able to take samples from our patients who are being treated we can actually understand what is exactly going on. Is it indeed T-cell exhaustion or is it something else that's going on that basically is um, making these treatments in some patients not as durable as we'd like them to be? And so I think that is another really exciting you know, development. Um, you know, before we were administering these to people, we had to focus on in the laboratory, you know, how these cells work um, and whatever models we could develop in that um, context. But now, um, you know, what I argue for is actually the clinic has also become part of the laboratory. And um, at places like UCSF, we actually have the infrastructure to really try to learn as much as we can from everybody that we treat. And I think, you know, for me, that also is in incredibly exciting and should enable uh, better treatments down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fong, for sharing all that information. Uh, indeed, it's a very interesting field and uh, we are uh, really following what's happening, you know, how, how what new treatments come out. So thank you very much. Um, Heidi and Cindy, uh, thank you for all your questions and for putting this uh, uh, topic today. Um, thank you very much. We also thank UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, this talk will be available on curetalks.com. So everyone have a good day.